Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar, Representation Matters Strategies for Building an Inclusive Bookshelf. Um, this webinar, I'm joined by uh, Rosalie Reyes and Dr. Jane Bean Folks, and they are going to introduce themselves in a little bit. But I just wanted to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and the link to view the webinar, as well as the questionnaire will be shared within the week. So keep an eye out for your email. Um, you can also contact me at kpotter at leanlow.com for a certificate of completion if you need it. So before we uh, dive into the material, uh, I will be reviewing the agenda with you all. So first, we are going to introduce ourselves. Um, we will be talking about, um, you know, we will be talking about what we do. And then uh, we will, I'll be going into the background of the classroom library questionnaire, the history behind it, why it was developed. Um, then we will go into how to use the classroom library questionnaire in your respective setting. Then we'll review the definition of a diverse library and then how to curate and develop a diverse library wherever you are. Then we'll be discussing engaging with families at home. Of course, we all know and are aware that virtual learning um, is very real this fall. And so we will be talking about where to find relevant resources for uh, developing a diverse library in your setting. Then we'll, to that end, we'll be talking about resources, different websites, um, blogs, uh, book awards that you can turn to for uh, referencing diverse books. And then we'll conclude with a great question and answer setting. So we're really excited um, and I am so glad to be joined by two um, experts in the field. And um, this is a very, obviously a very um, relevant topic. And I am the senior literacy specialist at Lee and Low Books. I develop the teacher's guides and the educator resources. Um, you may have seen me on webinars before. I'm in a different setting right now. Um, prior to Lee and Lowe, I've worked as a teacher um, and a literacy instructor, and I have my master's from Bank Street College of Education in uh, childhood general education and literacy. I also wanted to mention that one of our pi uh, panelists, um, Kai Strange, could not be with us today, so it'll just be myself, Rosalie, and Dr. Jane Bean folks. Hi, um, I'm Jane Bean, folks, and um, as Katie has so graciously um, stated earlier, I have um, been working in the field of education for well over 20 years, and I attended um, Teachers College, um, where I got my MED and my EDD in curriculum and teaching, um, and really looking at the the challenges that non-dominant language speakers face when they're learning the written academic language. So that was like the dissertation work. And then there's always life after the dissertation. And so for me, I really have been spending a lot of time looking at um, diverse and global literature because when we talk about engaging kids in, in classrooms, we really need to talk about the books um, that they're reading. And so fortunately, I've been able to um, work not just in New York City, but I've been able to do professional development across the country, um, looking at the social linguistic perspectives of teachers, and also looking at communities to kind of make that, that fit um, that creates success for all students. And I won't bore you with all of the different organizations and um, that I actually am working with and have written for, but I'm happy to be here and thank you so much. Thanks, Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rosie Reyes. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm joining on behalf of Teaching for Change uh, and Social Justice Books. Um, my position uh, is the coordinator of teacher engagement and professional development, and I oversee the DC area educators for social justice network. So within my position, um, I support curriculum development, um, 
children's literature reviews, and um, I'm native to the Bronx, New York. Thank you, Jane and Rosalie. And again, thank you so much for your for dedicating your time, expertise, and insights to this incredibly relevant topic. And so we want to hear from you all. Uh, we know you may be more than one of these, but what hat, uh, metaphorical hat, do you have on today during this webinar? We, uh, we want to know so that we can gear some of our language and what our discussion topics to who's joining us today. And so we'll give you all a few minutes to select. Okay, so it is looking like mainly librarians followed by teachers, uh, a few, uh, a few parents, professors and nonprofit organizations. So thank you all so much. Okay. So before we start, I wanted to give a brief background on Lee and Lowe books. Some of you may be new to us. So I wanted to give some history behind Lee and Lowe. Um, so we were, we're about to start our, uh, we're about to celebrate our 30th year anniversary. Um, that's a really big deal for us. And we're so excited um, that we're coming up on our 30th year in the publishing industry. We are the largest children's book publish, uh, we are the largest children's book publishers specializing in diversity in the United States. We are POC owned um, and an independent publisher, which is unique to the publishing landscape. Um, we also have everything from leveled readers that you use um, in guided reading and beginning reading settings, all the way through YA books. So we offer a range of uh, texts for young children. Um, we also offer complete customization for school districts nationwide. Um, so we really work with schools and tailor, um, you know, tailor their needs um, when we're, whenever we're working with educators, librarians, um, et cetera. And so we are hosting this webinar to that end to help people discover and use books and figure out what resources are worthy of using when you're embarking on this important journey of diversifying your library. And so some of the images that you see here, you'll see our classroom library questionnaire that we're going to really dive into today. We also uh, recently launched our diversity in publishing survey this year. Check it out on our blog. It's all about diversity in publishing. Um, and it was a follow-up from a, a survey that we did five years ago. You see the lows down at the bottom. We're family POC owned and we have a great team of um, also some former educators on our team um, working to our wonderful mission of, about, of books about everyone for everyone. So like I mentioned before, how we work with schools really on a personal individual basis, we developed the classroom library questionnaire in 2017 in response to teachers' requests. Uh, we were doing, um, we were naturally doing classroom library audits and customizations when we would go into schools and we would really figure out what the strengths of a library were and also what the gaps and areas of improvement were. So we figured let's create a tool, a concrete tool that teachers can use, educate, you know, teachers, educators, anyone can use in order to continue to diversify and strengthen their library. So we worked with experts such as Jane, who can talk a little bit about the process as well, librarians and educators as consultants to make this tool as effective and sensitive as possible. And so we recently updated it to reflect some critical changes that have happened in the past three years. Um, we added, uh, we changed some terminology, we added some additional questions. For example, one of the questions that, um, that we reconfigured and added was that, is there a person of color, a black person or native indigenous person on the front cover? to make sure that we're capturing as many elements as of, a library, of a diverse library as possible. Jane, did you also want to talk a little bit about the background? Yes, um, I, 
I remember, oh, it feels like years ago, um, but it really wasn't that long ago when, um, when you first started working on this project. And I think one of the major issues that had come up and really had intrigued me was the fact that there was a paucity of books written um, for people of color um, and for first um, Native nations in our many of our, our, li our classroom libraries. And, mm -hmm. um, and I was finding that as a professional developer at the time that as I moved across the country, many of the students struggled with finding themselves in literature. Um, and I, I think what, what I really have to commend Lee and Lowe for really going out and going after was to kind of take the process um, that you were using and really sort of quantify it for educators mm -hmm. um, um, in order to really break down where the, the opportunities for growth lies within a classroom library. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, it's been a wonderful journey. And I think that was so helpful for us getting as many perspectives as possible when we're developing this tool because it's been used across, you know, nationwide and by so many educators. So really making sure that we're, ca you know, capturing as many facets of, of an educator's perspective as possible. And so this is the full, um, this is the full questionnaire. It's broken down in six different sections. Um, you all, this is a free document that anyone is avail anyone is able to use. Um, and I also wanted to mention, you know, it's called the classroom library questionnaire, but it can certainly be used in a school library, in a, in a home setting, in a nonprofit organization library. It really can be used and reconfigured in any way that you want. Um, it's also not, um, you know, it's not a list of requirements, but it is something, it is a conversation starter and tool. Um, and so it's, it's, it makes you think about, okay, so where am I, you know, where are my gaps? Where are my strengths? Um, and so I encourage everyone to really take a, a deep dive into it. Um, like I mentioned before, the six different categories, the first question is the classroom library contains multiple books that include non-human anthropomorphic main characters. Um, so then there, the different check boxes that you check are strongly agree, agree, neither agree or disagree, disagree, strongly disagree. So we have everyone start by thinking about that and then we move into main characters and then it progresses into all of these different categories um, that you're looking for in a library. And we owe it to our students to offer as many perspectives and diverse titles as we possibly can. Um, and that's why we're all here today. And we are also proud to announce that it's, we're officially releasing it in Spanish. Um, and so this is available to any educator, caregiver, librarian, student. Um, and so it's really nice to pair alongside um, the English version of the classroom library questionnaire. And I know that there were questions um, prior to the webinar, what resources are there available for Spanish speakers? And this is definitely one of them. This is also um, a place where you can find it online. Um, there are many different places that you can find it. Um, it's on our website, it's on our blog. You'll also receive it in the email after this webinar um, has concluded within the week. So there are lots of different places that you can find it online. Um, feel free to give it to, who, um, to you know, your administration, different colleagues. Um, there's also an interactive PDF available, so you can actually click it online in case you don't, you know, a lot of us are doing virtual learning. Um, this is great to share. That's a virtual resource that you can actually click the check boxes um, and in case anyone doesn't have access to a printer. Um, and so before Jane goes into a little bit more about the black background of the, the questionnaire and some of the research behind it, I wanted to share this spread from Dream Builder. It's one of our new titles. It's called Dream Builder, the story of architect Philip Freelon. 
And um, it's a great picture book biography um, about Philip Freeland, the architect of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And he struggled to find himself represented in the material in his studies. So he went out of his way to find, to, um, to find books about architecture with people that looked like him. And we want to make sure that students in our life in our classroom libraries or in our libraries or homes already have the access to these texts and providing the most access equity and equality that we can in the books that we choose to have on our shelves so jane um if you wanted to um you know follow up with that and talk a little bit about the work that you've done yes uh Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's so interesting because here we are in 2020, right? And we're, we're talking about diversity within classroom libraries. And it's, it's really not that long ago, right, that this has truly become a lot of the, the work that um, I now look at doing in classroom. And the fact that there are so few books, and I would say about 10 years ago, so few books that were written about people of color that made it into the elementary classroom um, mm -hmm. was really truly the, the reasoning behind um, why we needed to examine our classroom libraries more closely. And the truth is many um, schools are, will limit what will go into a classroom library based on the program that's been selected um, to be used across um, a district. And then the other big piece that, that comes out is that at the end of the day, if students don't see themselves and if they don't see the world within the classroom, it's really hard for them to get a picture of the world and of the, the global um, changes and challenges that, that exist. Mm. So the work that we um, and I've been doing with the, the questionnaire has really led me to, to think more about who writes a book um, and are they from a particular group um, or have they spent time living with a particular group of people and really truly understanding versus sort of um, as I often will say to my students, just sort of journeying through to gather enough information in which to write a text. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. the, the whole notion of our, the, the classroom libraries has moved now into the classroom. And for me, it moved into the classrooms through my teacher preparation work that I was doing. Um, lastly, when I was at, at Marist College, I really worked with helping my pre-service teachers to understand that it's not just the library that sort of gifted to you. And I say that in a sort of um, challenging way because we know that new faculty members often do not get the best classroom libraries to begin their careers um, teaching. So I wanted to empower them with knowledge around how do they actually look at what they have been gifted with in order to determine what are the needs. How do you then go back and talk to your building principal um, and to say how and why um, their classroom library needed to change? And that's where I found the questionnaire being a very, very powerful tool for mm -hmm. my um, pre-service teachers. Because truly um, what would happen is, and I ex have experienced this, and many times as I was working in classrooms with teachers and particularly one particular fifth grade teacher I remember um, very vividly that she actually used the, the questionnaire with her students to help analyze the, the classroom library and mm -hmm. then to determine what was needed. So mm -hmm. having the, the questionnaire, it has really given a scaffold to the conversations that we want to have that will help students to really read a variety of literature, not just about themselves, but about other aspects of peoples and and the world. Exactly. And the um, I also wanted to mention about the fifth grade teacher, and you, and you can read this more on our blog, is that she thought that, you know, she had been teaching for a while, and she thought that she had done an adequate job at 
incorporating diverse texts in her classroom library, but after using the questionnaire, she found that it was actually not as diverse as she had originally envisioned. And so she went through with her students and her students took stacks of books and they went through the questionnaire and really examined critically what was on the shelves and then came up with these generalized statements about what they found about the library. And so that's a fabulous way that you can actually get your students involved in using the questionnaire and not just amongst faculty, educators, librarians, really getting the students involved. And this can be used, even though this was used in fifth grade, you could use it as young as first and second grade, where you know students can really observe and examine what's on their shelves. And Katie, I'm gonna say once we, we empower students with this knowledge, they really become the advocates. I yes. can't see how often students have come back to me <laughs> and said, Dr. Jane, Dr. Jane, we need to have this book. And I'm like, <laughs> um, but again, it's, it's about letting students know it's, it's, and to make them aware that we want their culture. We want mm -hmm. who they, they live with to be a big part of our, our classrooms. Exactly. Thank you, Jane. You're so right. And thank you for thank you for mentioning that point. And to that end, you know, it's so important for students to to see themselves in the text in their class in their classroom libraries. And I wanted to share the NYU culturally responsive scorecard that takes it a step above a classroom library and looks at um, and looks at the entire curriculum as a whole. So this is really the overarching view of what's in the light in the classroom and then the classroom library questionnaire is a more of a granular level. But the culturally responsive scorecard is fabulous to pair alongside the classroom library questionnaire because you can really examine what's in the what's in your actual curriculum that you use on a day to day basis. Um, so this is just another way for you to examine um, the books with a different kind of tool. Again, this is a this is an opportunity for you to look at really look at what can be supplemented or complemented. You are working with a set set of texts in a prescribed specific curriculum that you may not have choice over, but you can really look you can use this as an opportunity and the classroom library questionnaire to see where you can add some additions to the or you know supplementary or complementary titles. And Rosalie is going to take us through this infographic. Thank you so much, Katie and uh, Dr. Jane. Thank you both. Uh, so what you see here is the 2018 Diversity in Children's Literature graphic that is produced by Sarah Park Dalen and David Hewitt. And these statistics are compiled by the Cooperative Children's Book Center from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I'll let you review the statistics. And one important distinction to note between um, this 2018 version and the, 20, the previous 2015 version is the deliberate decision to crack a section of the children's mirrors. So this is referencing Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop's mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And this is to indicate what Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas calls distorted funhouse mirrors of the self. Okay. And these distorted cracked mirrors signify the misrepresentation of underrepresented communities. And we wanted this infographic to show not just the low quantity of existing literature, but also sometimes the inaccuracy that even um, that an uneven quality of some of those books. Mm -hmm. So if these startling statistics leave you weary on a lighter note on the back side of the printed version of the postcard, there are listed ways to take action and names of organizations and individuals, uh, which we'll share later, that provide uh, critical reviews of children's literature, recommended titles. So we um, highly recommend that you share the image widely within your teaching and learning networks and uh, feel free to request printed copies of the book at the socialjusticebooks.org site. So, Oh, great. Thanks, Rosalie, for sharing that. We hope that, that you can request the printed version. Yes. Mm -hmm. I support the USPS. Uh, yes. We hope that this infographic, along with Leanne Lowe's classroom library questionnaire, can help move uh, push forward conversations and lead to real change in children's publishing. Mm -hmm. All right, I can dive into the creating an anti bias library. 
Um, so now I'll tell a bit more about uh, Social Justice Books, a project of Teaching for Change. Uh, we have carefully selected mostly cultural and social justice books that span over 50 book lists for caregivers and educators. Um, our collection of articles share uh, explanations for the lenses we use when critiquing and reviewing children's books and YA titles. Um, it's important to highlight that we examine not only representation, but the storyline, the quality of the writing of each book. So it is not enough to simply diversify the characters in children's literature. We're also concerned about who is writing the story, mm -hmm. amplifying own voices, um, what the characters are doing, how issues of power and activism are being introduced, and uh, the representation of people in community rather than in isolation. So. Mm -hmm. A uh, resource that we highly recommend to use in tandem with the Classroom Library Questionnaire is the Guide for Selecting Anti-Bias uh, Children's Books, which you'll find on the site. And we believe that as cultural products, children's books reflect what is valued in society and the attitudes that our society have about diversity, um, power relationships between different groups, mm -hmm. and uh, various social identities. So these can be racial, ethnic, gender, economic class, sexual orientation, disability. Um, so some of the tips for analyzing the children's books you'll find through the guide is uh, checking illustrations, looking for stereotypes, looking for tokenism, invisibility, um, and as you explore these tips for analyzing the books in your school collections or your home libraries, um, we recommend also um, diving into the four goals of anti-bias education, and those are centered on uh, fostering identity, diversity, centering fairness, and justice. Mm. Um. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosalie. Oh, sorry. Oh, and then I was just going to leave with some uh, curricular planning approaches. Um, so um, as you uh, think through oh, the engineer, oh, no worries, um, and connect the four goals of anti-bias education, uh, some things to consider are um, what aspects of diversity can be part of this topic or unit. Um, how can I use this topic or book to provide accurate information and counter misconceptions and stereotypes? Mm -hmm. How can I use this book to support and strengthen children's innate sense of justice and their capacity to change unfair situations to fair ones? And then what do I need to learn to teach this accurate, accurately? So understanding the, that the learning begins, continues, and lives within us. So making sure that we're doing that work and uh, ourselves too. Thank you so much, Rosalie. I think those questions are really wonderful. And as we're heading into the school year, I think they're, they're incredibly relevant. Um, and I hope that you all um, listening in are able to share those questions as well with your fellow colleagues. Um, I also really find the review key um, super helpful. Um, the recommended, recommended with caveat and not recommended. That's just such a visual, uh, visually pleasing way of knowing, you know, of just of viewing the um, the anti-bias children's guide and so thank you so much for sharing that resource and I hope you all find it really helpful as much as I do so thank you so much and Jane is going to take us through um, through some points about how to define a diverse library exactly and and the thing that I often um, when we start talking about diversity, um, very often the first thing that comes to mind is, is race or ethnicity. And, you know, I, I constantly am saying to um, my student teachers and my faculty is that we have to think about the fact that the literature is going to transform human experience and it reflects back on us and then it reflects also on our lives and other experiences that are part of the larger experience. Mm -hmm. So race and ethnicity are part of diversity, but what about ageism? What about gender? What about ability, right? Those are all part of a diverse, should be a part of a diverse library. And mm -hmm. so that's really what makes a diverse library different from other libraries. It has all of these aspects of diversity and not just about race. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important that our, our libraries reflect our students um, in, in all their aspects. And I'm, you mentioned uh, um, a moment ago about 
how books can mirror the should be a mirror image of of our students in what they look like, but also in regards to their rhetoric. Right. Very often students will open up a book and I've had students who will read um, books about the Caribbean and they'll say to me, but Dr. Jane, we don't talk like this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so when we really look at diversity, it's about all of its various aspects and not just the image that's on the front cover right, of a book. Mm -hmm. so we want our students to be able to see the world, right? To be a part of that globalness um, that happens across the world. And it's really through literacy that we open those doors. Um, the fact that it's a window into other cultures. It mirrors other people that we see. It helps us to identify with difference, right? And mm -hmm. to understand race, socioeconomic differences, um, gender, language. And that is the beauty of the literature that's in a diverse library. And I thank you so much, Jane. And I also wanted to share this, this kind of, um, follows up on your points. The, the spread that I wanted to show on this page is from one of our titles. She was the first, The Trailblazing Life of Shirley Chisholm. Um, and it's super relevant book um, today. And this spread shows Shirley actually lived in Barbados for a, for a little while during her childhood. And, and this page in particular says, Barbados was filled with people with brown skin like Shirley. She saw teachers, preachers, and shopkeepers taking care of island business. Seeing them, Shirley understood that when she grew up, she could take charge and get things done too. And so I'm going to quickly show a clip. Um, uh, Jane is on this panel. Um, it's from a few years ago at, the, uh, at an ILA um, session. And um, it's uh, Jackie Jacobs, Dr. John de McNair, uh, Dr. Jane, and uh, Dr. Jane Fleming. And this we find is a really uh, fitting way of defining um, a diverse library. So I wanted to share this clip with you all. Developing our, our curriculum, we're looking for where can the text of point really be used with varying reading ability, varying student, varying demographics, and also um, social identity. So we're trying to make sure that we're going to reach every student along every aspect of their being. Right, and for me, belonging to me, there are two things that I think about when I think about social identity. Life. The first thing I think about, one of the ways I think about diversity is diversity in terms of genre. So making sure that I'm exposing children to fantasy, to poetry. When it comes to poetry, for example, I'm thinking about people over here who have grew up seeing Gilbert Keith, and Jane Fong, Jennifer Joyner, um, Nikki Bryan. So thinking about diversity in terms of genre and format, because we think about format, like some people will identify graphic novels as a genre, and really it's really a format. So format and genre are really important diversity of format and genre. And then the second thing I think about touches on what Kathy mentioned, this idea of touching on the different identity markers that affect who we are. So thinking about race and religion, even disability, for example, I try to pull from books that have won the Snyder Awards. Um, I'm not sure many of you know about the Snyder, give them for outstanding books that have characters with disabilities. And so that's a way for me to be able to know some books I can pull, like Rain, Rain by Ian Martin by Grove Self History. So I think about all those identity markers, religion, race, class, sexual orientation. So for me, genre, format, and then identity markers. Wow, you guys are setting up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, because I would say ditto to, to all of those things, but in addition, I would probably say, for me, it's about what's in the collection that's going to transform my students um, and to provide for them a greater imagination for what they're going to see in the world, um, here locally as well as globally. Um, so it's like all of the above and. Okay. <clears throat> um, 
So for people, I, I was looking in the chat box, and I'm sorry if the volume was a little low on the video, but what Dr. John McNair was saying is that we we're, we're also should be looking at uh, diversity in terms of genre. So thinking about poetry, about fantasy, are you capturing diversity within all of the different genres? Back to the fifth grade teacher, she, uh, the fifth grade teacher using the classroom library questionnaire, she found that she had captured, you know, the picture book biographies well in terms of diversity. And I think that a lot of teachers across the country, that's probably an area of, of an area of this, that's a strength. Um, but really looking at all of the different genres and saying, wow, I can really improve the diversity in my poetry genre. So that's just another way to think about a diverse library. And um, this, Jane had mentioned this before, but it's not just about color and identity. It's a, a li library should be reflective of all kinds of diversity. And so this spread I wanted to show is from one of our titles, Zombies Don't Eat Veggies. It's available in English and in Spanish. And it's the first Latinx book about zombies. So this is a way that you can um, really get kids to um, can understand how they are both similar and different and all the different things that we have in common before negative, you know, before negative stereotypes take root. So why can't a, bo why can't a zombie book happen to have Latinx zombies as well? So um, this is a great fun title that can, um, that can really get readers of all ages laughing and enjoying the book. Um, and uh, Jane will take us through um, how to curate and develop a diverse library a little more, but I also wanted to explain this spread. It's from When the Shadbush Blooms. This is a title that we just released this year. We actually brought it back to print. There was a teacher that we worked with that showed us this book and said, I love this book, it's, but it's out of print. And so that's one of our, uh, that's something that we do at Lee and Lowe is take some diverse books that go out of print and if um, and we tried to bring them back to print. Um, this is written by uh, Lenape author Carla Messenger, and the text you'll see is only on one side of the page, but the text applies to both illustrations, both the past and the present, and it's about a Lenape girl enjoying activities, then the fall being outside, um, seasonal corn, but the text applies to both, um, past and present. So this is a wonderful native title that you can use this year, um, and it's a way to also um, talk about history as well as um, you know, acknowledging acknowledging and addressing the, the present. Um, and so Carla Messenger also has a wonderful website, um, Native American Heritage Programs, if you want to check it out for additional activities. Um, she's a wonderful resource. So um, Jane, if you wanted to talk a little bit more about how you get um, teachers curating and developing their own libraries. Absolutely, and I, I think one of the, the best ways to really dig into um, curating and developing um, a diverse library is through reading. Um, and I can tell you very often I would begin um, my classes by bringing in crates of books and asking um, my pre-service teachers to take, you know, three or four books and I want you to read the, the book, you know, so we spend some time in, in reading. And, you know, sometimes as, as graduate students, we look at this work and we're like, oh my gosh, my professor's going to make me to read, right, right here in the classroom. But there's, there's a purpose behind that. Mm -hmm. And the purpose behind it is, um, students will come up with a, a title and they're going to want to talk about it and then we start you know really asking those questions and almost going back to the questions that are on the, the questionnaire Katie to mm -hmm. talk about what do we know about this book not just the storyline because so often we get really wowed by the storyline or we get wowed by the cover but do we actually take a moment to open up the back cover of, of a book and to read about the author, right? And to find out who they are, what's the, the meaning and the relationship to, to the book. Um, mm -hmm. What about the illustrator, right? Is the illustrator from that particular culture? Have they spent time in that culture? And therefore, 
can we trust that the pictures are reflective of, of the text or are they just something that's done out of in the world of art, which is great and wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we really want to start talking about matching um, cultures and people and genders and identity, it helps to have the voice of those who have lived and walked the walk and talked the talk. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I'm constantly looking at, at books and, and reviewing books. I often will look at the cover of a book and I'll go, oh, this looks like it's going to be really interesting. And then I read the book and I'm going, oh. <laughs> right. Oh. Exactly. I also wanted to mention um, that back matter and afterwards and forwards are also really important to read. Sometimes we skip over them, um, but they contain valuable information about the book, especially if the author and or illustrator is from the particular culture. You can find out a lot more about the story and how it's meaningful to them. I know at Lee and Lowe, we really pride ourselves on, on forwards, afterwards, and back matter. So that's another place that you can turn to to ensure the validity of the book as well. So, and I would also say that you've got to also look at, at the message. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what is it that the author is really wanting to share um, with the audience that's, that's reading the text? I just finished a, a current book that's just out. It's titled All He Knew, written by Helen Frost. And I'm like, okay, I know that author, but I didn't know the connection between the author and the actual um, text, and I didn't get right away the message until I started reading the the inside back inside cover and then the sort of postscript to mm -hmm. the, and then right away it's like oh I get it I see it because it was really truly and I don't want to give the the message of the story away beyond that you have to sort of walk in the shoes and to understand the challenges that the character and those who are supporting the character are facing. And it's not until we kind of do all of that, that work that we can really understand we, and do the work as literacy instructors that we understand the overall message. Um, I don't know how often you or um, have read a book and then it's not until the second read of the book mm -hmm. and you go, oh my gosh, there's so much more I could have done with this book with my students. Mm. Um, and it, it's about really becoming more familiar um, with that text. And so I really want you to talk, Katie, about Marisol because she yeah. is <laughs> phenomenal. My Marisol, um, so Marisol McDonald doesn't match um, is you see Marisol, she's eating her peanut butter and jelly tortillas. And um, she is, it's really a one, it's a, it's a great book about identity, um, race, and, you know, she, people tease her because she has brown skin and red hair and say, and she loves wearing colorful clothes and she's saying, and everyone says that she's mismatched, but it's really who she is. And that's, it's a critical part of her identity. And so this story is, is a great way to introduce students to uh, Mon you know, Monica Brown, this is a story that's near and dear to her heart, its own voices. And so this story would not be the same if it wasn't own voices. Um, and so really looking at who's telling, like Jane said, who's telling the story. Um, additionally, um, in addition to, you know, analyzing the author and illustrator, what Jane mentioned about doing multiple reads of a book, and that's how you get to know, are there stereotypes or other harmful references in the story? You know, if you're flipping through text, you don't really know if this is going to, you know, you have to really sit down and read and analyze the book um, to examine the message and to make sure that it's reflective um, and culturally responsive. And um, this is a spread that I wanted to show from when Aiden became a brother. And this, uh, this speaks to the point that diversity goes beyond res racial representation, like what we've been saying. Um, this book is about Aiden and he just happens to be trans. He's a trans boy, but it's really a story about Aiden becoming a new brother, a new sibling, and how he can do his best to make the world a better place for his sibling. 
Um, it's not about his transition. There is maybe one, there's, a, there's one spread that's dedicated to his transition, but it's really unique in, trans, uh, in children's literature uh, about trans children and that it's not focusing on the transition. It's really focusing on becoming a sibling. And that is something that many children can relate to. Um, and so it's a wonderful way, uh, it's a wonderful book to bring into your classroom that, and it's a title that explores the range and diversity of experiences, voices, and perspectives within a culture and group. Uh, so that's a little bit about when Aiden became a brother. I encourage you all to check it out. And can I just jump in here because, and we're gonna, I want also to kind of say that books that, that we can read about Aiden, books such as Sparkle Boy, um, I've come up more and more now in school settings where we have um, students in kindergarten who were born maybe female but identify as male and will dress as male. And so it's like, it's a way of, of talking about um, gender in, in such a way that not only the students get to understand what's happening and not to challenge, right, not to bully, mm -hmm. but also to help and to support parents. And exactly. I think helping our, our literature is another way of helping parents to understand this bigger, broader world in which we, we live. Yes, thank you so much, Jane. And Rosalie is going to talk us through um, a little bit about um, what, uh, what they have a teaching for change in, change in terms of resources for families. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Jane Bean Books, for that connection. Um, what you see in this photo here is an image from our 2019 Teach Central America Week, which we're really excited that the uh, 2020 week is coming up this October. So I keep an eye out for that. But this is an image from our Roving Readers Program, which engages parents in selecting multicultural books and then serving as special guest readers in the classroom. And we realized during um, emergency online instruction that this would have to be, take place in a virtual space. Um, that this program engages the family members in sharing their own personal stories and literature in classrooms to promote literacy and affirm identity, kind of what we were just speaking to. So uh, the students get to experience a direct link uh, between the classrooms um, and home, and then parents gain uh, their read aloud and critical, liter um, critical literacy skills as well. So uh, teachers are challenged to rethink the role of parents in literacy education. And um, this image actually features a Leon Lowe title, The Rainbow Weaver, where um, we brought um, caregivers in to uh, read during the uh, Teach Central America Week, and students were engaged uh, in conversation in multiple um, languages. They um, experienced a, a weaving activity afterwards, so it was very um, experiential. Uh, I, I encourage you all to also look at our um, resources for family listed on the Teaching for Change site. And we're excited to share that we've also launched Freedom Reads. This is our anti-bias book talk series. Um, and so beyond just sharing book lists, we want to share how we select the books um, so that parents and teachers can do this um, if they're same. So it is uh, in part an anti-bias training, part book review. So uh, these short segments uh, highlight different anti-bias books um, to strengthen an anti-bias, anti-racist um, lens when critically analyzing children's books. So it is designed with, uh, with parents in mind. So um, the episodes run just under 10 minutes each, not too long. Um, <laughs> and, and each one walks viewers through um, the synopsis of the books, connecting relevant resources available, and will point out um, several of the uh, anti-bias goals. And I noticed in the chat that someone had mentioned um, wanting to hear those again, so I um, can share those now. So uh, it, those were connected again to identity, diversity, um, and um, recognizing unfairness and um, justice. So each child will demonstrate self-awareness, confidence, family pride, and positive social identities. Each child will express comfort and joy with human diversity, have accurate language for human differences, and deep caring human connection. 
each child will increasingly recognize unfairness, have language to describe unfairness and understand that unfairness hurts. And each child will um, demonstrate empowerment and the skills to act with others or alone against prejudice and or discriminatory actions. So you can find more um, at the link shared here. We'll be sure to share uh, with uh, any follow up um, materials that go out to you all. But we hope that you um, check out some of the episodes and um, titles that we recommended in yeah. these and this is the youtube page is really uh easy to view and all the different videos they've done a really wonderful job at showing all the different um all the different videos in a clean way um i really uh i want to be cognizant of everyone's time um uh and make sure that we, you know, we have some great questions that I'm going to pose. And then we also have, um, I want to show our resources slide. Um, but again, wanting to, met, you know, wanted to mention, you know, work with um, your public libraries and librarians on how to bring more diverse literature in your home. Public libraries have virtual read alouds. Um, so please visit their websites. Also school librarians are, in, are always an incredible resource, especially now more than ever, teachers, school librarians, families, we all should be working together in the service of our students, um, especially if it's a combination of virtual learning, in-person learning. This is a difficult time, and so the more that we can collaborate and work together, the better. Um, Storyline Online, I mentioned uh, Zombies Don't Eat Veggies, one of our titles. That is available on Storyline Online with Jaime Camille. Um, he is uh, he's one of the voices in Coco. He is does such an amazing job. He reads it in both English and in Spanish. Um, so Spanish-speaking families and teachers out there, please check that out. Um, we also have, we also um, had some, um, of our read alouds online. So now to the really fun part, um, all of the resources. Again, this link will be um, sent out after, so please don't, uh, don't fret. Um, you will be getting all of these links. Um, so we went through and really combed um, the internet for some toolkits, some resources on how to build uh, diverse libraries. And so, um, You'll see here all of these different, you know, from School Library Journal, from Teaching Tolerance, The Conscious Kid, um, Social Justice Books, um, and then Rosalie, uh, you know, Rosalie had uh, spoken about the anti-bias, um, the guide for selecting anti-bias children's books and anti-bias education. These are all of the book awards. Um, and this is by no means um, the full list. There are certainly more that are not on here, but these are a great uh, way to look for diverse texts um, in your library. These are all the different books and you can go through the archives of what books have won these awards. Um, so please check these out. I hope I'm not going too fast, but again, everyone is going to be receiving these. These are additional blogs and websites um, that you can turn to for diverse texts and diverse literature. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, some of these already, but just wanting to give everyone a chance to, to look through them. Um, and you can certainly do your own research as well. Okay, so now for the question and answer, um, you know, we have, seven-ish minutes. Um, so I want to get through um, the questions that people were asking. Um, and so Rosalie, I wanted to start with you. You know, how can I, um, we had a question, how can I work with students who have language-based learning difficulties and diverse books? Where can I find some great high-low books that are engaging, but that aren't babyish um, and that will make my students feel empowered? Thank you, Katie. That's a great question. So for folks thinking about um, high-low books, so high interest, low level reads, um, I think about um, graphic novels. So <laughs> similar to comics, I think um, graphic novels are great with the use of visuals. Uh, they have limited amount of text, but still do wonderful jobs at telling deep and full stories. Um, and uh, my thoughts that um, 
if the visuals, the imagery, if that's where the joy for reading stems from, um, let's hold on to that. And if that's where we can sustain the joy of reading, um, let's explore and amplify gra uh, graphic novels. They're a great way um, to strengthen vocabulary. They can um, build confidence and stamina for um, uh, any struggling readers and develop a deeper appreciation for um, storytelling. So um, I'd love to upload. Thanks, Rosalie. Um, Jane, this is a question that came up many times. You know, as we go into the school year, we're working with budget cuts, lots of different adverse, ab we're working with adversity. Um, people, you know, teachers, librarians want to know, first, how can I have these conversations with my administration about incorporating diverse literature into my library? And additionally, how can I work on diversifying my library when I'm dealing with budget cuts? You know, what, uh, what is some, what are, what's your advice on that? Uh, great question. So here's the, the challenge. Um, in this time of adversity and, and budget cuts, I think it's gonna be really important that we work with the larger community and not just the school community. Um, and so thinking about your parent organizations and community organizations. Um, I've experienced where if I reach out to community orgs to let them know that there is a particular topic or a grade level that we're working on a project, it's amazing how much of a response I will get from, from the community. And then parent organizations, certainly your, your PTOs, if you have, um, in, in our district, we have Achieve, which is a parent organization that really works on developing funds through various fundraisers to support the various programs and, and teachers who have a desire. So for example, as a teacher, you could apply for a grant to look at um, increasing diversity low level reads but high interest for example in one mm -hmm. classroom um, but definitely your parent organizations your community organizations and i'm going to say don't rule out your public library talk to your children's librarian talk to the ya librarian because there may be opportunities to do joint projects that will bring funding not only to the library but also to your classroom library mm. thank you so much jane I also wanted to say about grants, we at Lee and Lowe do not give out grants, but we do have a blog post that's, um, that has links to places where you can look uh, for grants and how to apply for them. Um, so check that out on our blog um, for literacy-based grants. Um, Rosalie, uh, there was a question um, that came up, you know, how can... Um, Oh, so what are some great resources in Spanish to build, um, to build diverse libraries? So um, I would encourage folks to explore the questionnaire that's available in Spanish. Very excited. But, um, and um, our Latinx, Afro-Latinx um, book titles that are listed on the Social Justice book site. I'm also thinking of Colorín Colorado. They also... Mm -hmm. Um, many resources for um, EL um, mm -hmm. educators and um, students. And if there's a specific topic or time that uh, time frame that you're interested in um, centering, feel free to reach out uh, to Social Justice Books, and we can help with um, that um, identifying a text that you're interested in that you think would be um, really impactful for your classroom. We're always excited to partner with. Um, teachers and helping them find um, these resources. Oh, that's, that's great to know. Thanks, Rosalie. Um, Jane and Rosalie, um, you know, both of you, uh, both of you can answer this. Um, and this is, I think this would really resonate with our teachers um, and librarians on here. Um, if a favorite book of mine is really white and it's a favorite of my students, what can I do? So, you know, if, if a teacher came to me asking that question, I, I guess my first answer would be, I would do nothing. Um, I would, because I don't want to take that 
that sort of pride away from the students, but I would want to place beside it mm -hmm. other titles, mm -hmm. right? Other resources that, that they may um, gravitate towards. And then I would want to have conversation about at, at another time, but to start to have that conversation very much like that fifth grade teacher had with her room is to kind of look at how do we know that this is a trusted resource mm -hmm. and, and, and to build that conversation that way. Um, mm. and, and I've had students like sort of be so in love with the book that they're not going to, to let it go, but it's now they have a deeper understanding. Exactly. And I wanted to say really quickly about the questionnaire. It's not, like I said, it's just a tool. We're not asking you to throw everything out. We want you to think about ways that you can supplement and complement. And you might even have those books already. It's just thinking about, you know, being creative with the way you use books. Rosalie, did you want to mention anything? I similarly was thinking about um, pairing, like what type of paired text, paired activities uh, mm -hmm. can um, make the uh, learning experience um, more diverse and inclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to throw away some of our uh, favorites, but thinking about ways that um, uh, we can make the experience uh, overall more representative. Yeah. So I think that's it. Uh, that we we covered a lot in an hour. Um, I know that a lot of uh, a lot of you still might have questions. This is my email, kpotter at leanlow.com. Please let me know um, if you have any outstanding questions or want to know, especially if you want me to direct something to Rosalie or Jane, I can also um, continue to correspond with them. Um, so please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. You can also follow us on social media. These are our different social media channels. And here's my contact information again. So I wanted to thank everyone uh, for taking the time uh, to join us today. Wanted to thank Rosalie and Jane again for offering their amazing expertise and their insights. They've dedicated a lot of time to help me prepare this uh, webinar for you all. So um, thanks everyone and um, best of luck as we, enter, as we enter the school year. And again, let's all support each other and continue to diversify our libraries. So thank you so much, everyone.